This morning's title is called Slaying the Giants in the Land. Slaying the Giants in the Land. <clears throat> Did you know that we are all part of a, a lineage of giant killers? Come on. That, that you were all a part of a generation of giant killers. And if I was going to ask you guys right now, if I were to ask everybody in here this morning to, to mention Bible I mean, in the Bible where you would know about giant killers, most of us would say David. David, Moses. David uh, killed Goliath, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go to turn, we're going to turn to First Samuel this morning. We're going to go. If you're watching right now, we're going to be turning. We're going to be reading out of First Samuel 17. And now listen, I am not very good with a lot of these words that are in the in the in this in this script in this part of the because these names are wow they're just not natural names. <clears throat> but I'm going to do my best to say these names. So we're going to be reading out of First Samuel uh, 17. And I'm going to read you the story about David and Goliath. Let me know when you guys are there. <clears throat> so I don't, excuse me, out of 1 Samuel 17. <clears throat> And the Philistines now mustered their army for battle, and they camped between Soko and Judah and Azka at the Ephus and Damon. Damon. Saul countered, uh, countered by gathering his Israelite troops near the valley of Elah. So the Philistines and the Israelites could face each other on the opposite hills with the valley between them. Then Goliath the Philistine... The champion from God came out of the Philistines' ranks to face the forces of Israel. That's what it says. It says that he was over nine feet tall. That's, that's huge. It says that he was over nine feet tall, and he wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed over 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armors, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. And the shaft of his spear was so heavy and thick as a weaver's beam. And it was tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. He also had an armor bearer that walked in front of him, carrying a shield. So I want to, I want to give a, a, a picture, a visual. You got this nine foot tall giant wearing 125 pounds of armor just on the front. He's got this spear, and on the head of the spear, just the arrow part of the spear weighed over 15 pounds. Just the part where I mean 125 pounds, that's probably like just the average. Body weight, I would assume. I don't know. But he was literally carrying another person worth of armor. So, and then he had an armor bearer that walked ahead of him carrying a shield. So everywhere he went, wherever Goliath walked, he had somebody in front of him with a shield. <clears throat> Goliath then stood and shouted, a taunt across to the Israelites. And he said this, Why are you all coming out to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, and you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. And if he kills me, then I will be your slave. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. And then he says, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. 
And then it says this, and it says, Then Saul, Saul and the Israelites heard this, and they were terrified. And it says that they were deeply shaken. Deeply shaken. Now I want us to take a moment, because doesn't that just sound so familiar? Doesn't that sound familiar? <clears throat> You see, the tactics of the enemy have not changed from back then to today. The enemy's tactics have not changed. He is simply adapted. He's adapted and he's evolved by the agreement that we give to the enemy. The attack is still the same. Let me give you an example. The enemy comes how? He comes with intimidation. Isn't that the way the enemy comes today? He comes to intimidate us. And this passage, if you look on, on uh, where it says, he wore a bronze helmet and a bronze coat weighing 125 pounds. And his armor, leg armor, he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder and the shaft on the spear was so heavy and thick. And, and it said that the iron spear weighed over 15 pounds. And he had an armor bearer that walked in front of him. That is supposed to intimidate the enemy. He didn't need all that armor. The guy was 10 feet tall. He probably could have got away with just, you know, but there's an intimidation factor. Then the enemy comes to attack our vision. He attacks our vision. How did he do it with David and how did he do it with the Israelites? He says, I will defy the armies of Israel today. Send me the man who I will fight. You see, when the Israelites encountered the Philistines, they saw Goliath, and they saw him from a place of fear. They saw Goliath from a place of fear. They saw the giant in the land from a place of fear. They didn't see them. They didn't see the Philistines from a place of victory. <clears throat> they didn't see the victory that was before them. Then the enemy comes, and he comes after your identity. He comes after who you are. He doesn't want you to know who you are as a son and daughter, because when you come to a realization and understanding that you are sons and the righteousness of heaven is inside of you, then it's a whole other realm of glory that you step into. Listen. If I become a multi-millionaire and I have everything in the earthly possible, there is nothing that's going to tell me that I can't go buy what I want because I have all access and all means. Listen, you are sons and daughters and all authority of heaven has been given to you. See, Goliath came after the identity of who they were. He was after the identity of the Israelites. He tells them, I am the Philistine champion. You are just merely the servants. Doesn't that, doesn't that sound like the enemy? You're nobody. You don't have a ministry. Look at you. you you're not going to make it. You want to go full-time ministry? How are you going to make it? You see, those are things that the enemy comes to lie and steal and kill. He comes after your identity. He comes after who you are. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Those who are watching, I'm going to ask you a question. What are the giants in your land this morning? What are the giants in your land? What are the strongholds that rob you of your faith 
and enslave you into fear. And it's not something you're going to answer out loud. It's just something, just evaluate yourself. Because I'm going to be transparent. One of my giants that I had to face was this. It was the fear of failing. It was my fear of failing God. And I, I remember one time, maybe about five years ago, four, yeah, maybe about five years ago, I got an invitation to do, to do a Skype crusade. Yeah, never heard of this before. Never heard of this before. But they asked me to do a Skype crusade in Pakistan. And basically what they did is they, they, they invite hundreds and hundreds of people to be a part of this crusade. And you, you know what? You do it what God puts in your hand. But let me tell you about the level of hunger that was there in this meeting. There was a room filled with people from Pakistan sitting on the floor, Indian style, in a dirt hut, with their, you know, they're, they're there, and they're hungry, and all they're doing is looking at a little 13-inch monitor, a laptop faced this way on the table. And here I am in my studio, and I'm like, I had a big old projection in the back, and I could see all the people on the camera, and they were watching me on a little bitty laptop. And I remember I prepared myself, you know, and I'm like, man, Lord, I'm going to, you're going to give me an opportunity, and I'm going to share, and I'm going to, I mean, I just had this grand expectation. And it came time to do the ministry, and I began to preach. And I'm talking to the camera, and then as I'm talking, my internet starts garbling up because they didn't have a good connection over there. And there's a delay. So every word I was speaking was coming in like a minute late. And I, I mean, and I had so much that I was wanting to share. And by the end of it, I got so frustrated. I got frustrated. I'm going to be honest. I just got frustrated because it's like, man, nothing's working. What is this? I mean, God, you gave me one opportunity, and I'm like, I'm blowing it. I'm just blowing this thing. And I just remember I just stopped ministering. I stopped where I was at. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to pray. And I just began to pray. And I just began to release the kingdom of heaven, release the glory. And I remember when I was finished, I closed up my thing. And I sat there in my office. And I just began to weep. I was crying. I mean, I, I, I took this really hard. And I remember I went to my wife, and I told my wife, I said, man, I blew it. I said, I blew it. And this is, this is real. I mean, I, I, this was a, an actual feeling that I was feeling, this emotion that I had. And I was like, man, babe, I, I blew it, man. I had one opportunity. I had one opportunity to release your heart, Father. And I had all these words that you had given me for them. I mean, and I knew it was from God. <clears throat> I knew that it was the Lord that was giving me these words and I was going to release. And, and I blew it. And I, I mean, I, I wept. And, and my wife was like, no, don't worry about it. I said, no, you don't understand. Because, see, I had a giant in my, in my land. My giant was I was afraid. I was fearful of failing God. I was afraid to fail. I'm just being transparent. Can we do that? I mean, can I be honest? You know, not everybody has it together. <laughs> so I remember the next day, you know, I kind of, I wept most of the time about that. And the next day I get, a, I get a call from the pastors in Pakistan. And they, 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 I'm, on the, I'm on the video Skype with them and the pastor says, Pastor, pastor, you know not what happened. I said, what happened? They said, when you stood up and you began to pray, he said, there were three witches in the room. The witches stood up and they, they began to shake under the power of God. Then they fell to the knees, gave their life to the Lord, and got set free. And I'm like, 
What? He said, and there was a little boy that was sitting in the front row. He had club feet and club hands. He stood up and his legs and his arm popped out. And the woman got sent. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? And then I got off the phone, I mean, the Skype with him, and I'm like blown away. And the Lord said, see, it was never about you. It was never about you. You see, Holy Spirit will articulate every word that comes out of your mouth. And for me, it might have been blah, 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 blah. But to them, it was like Holy Ghost, fire, power, and glory, signs and wonders, kingdom of heaven being demonstrated. That's what they were hearing. You see? And I share that because that was, a, that was a giant in my land. That was something that I had to learn how to overcome. What is your giant in your land this morning? Is it the spirit of pride? Fear of failure? Maybe it's rejection. What about jealousy? What about lack of faith? God, I trust you. I believe you, God. But I don't believe you enough for my next meal. I don't believe you enough for propane. I don't believe. You see what I'm saying? What is a giant in your land? Siri? What about being a doer? Maybe it's in your identity, not knowing who you are. We need to begin to cry out for a fresh revelation of God's awesome glory and power. We must have, we must have ears to hear. I'm going to ask you a question. Whose voice echoes in your ear? Do you agree with what you see? Or do you agree with what God sees for you? You see, God sees the big picture. We see what's before us. I can see so many people in the room, but in the spirit, I see this place overflowing. I see revival hitting. I see wheelchairs, and I see bodies coming in. <sighs> I believe that. I can see it. That's my reality. That's why we're here. That's vision. Vision that you see when your eyes are shut. It lets us see how God sees. See? Father, I just thank you, God. I thank you for your presence, God. I thank you for vision. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge you. <laughs> because we serve a good God. In Numbers, you can read about Moses when he sent out the spies. He sent out the spies to spy on the promised land. And when they returned, the spies came back with a bad report. They saw the giants in the land. The spies saw the giants in the land. 
Why don't we turn? Let's turn to Numbers 13. We're going to start on verse 32. <clears throat> Thank you, Father. Shaka donkey. <laughs> Holy Ghost. Father, you're so good. So we're going to start at Numbers 13, verses 32 to 33. And I'm reading out of the NLT. It says, And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which you have gone as spies is the land that devours the inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw there are men of great stature. They saw the giants. They were the descendants of Enoch. They came from the giants. And it says that we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight. You see, they didn't see how God saw. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. And the reality is, God didn't see them like a grasshopper. God saw them as the giant. We have to get out of the mentality where we say, you know, it's a big devil and a little, little God. The truth is, we serve a big God and a little bitty devil is under our feet. That's the reality. That's the truth. Are you a Moses generation? Are you a Joshua generation? Ah. Many times we base our confidence and faith on the outward circumstance instead of what God has told us to do. Well, I've only got so much money in my pocket. Or I've only got this car. Or I only got a $5 microphone. Well, let me tell you what. When we started our ministry, we started off with a $5 microphone. And I valued that $5 microphone. And then the Lord began to flood it and began to bless it. And Radio Earth Jesus was birthed, broadcasting all over the world with a $5 microphone. Come on. Take that, devil. You got to see how God sees. Sometimes the Lord says, you got to do what I put in your hand before I bless you and breathe on the other. It's kind of like when you say to your kids, hey, I remember my son wanted a guitar. And he's like, Dad, I want this guitar. I said, you know how much that guitar cost? You don't even know how to play. I said, why don't we get you this guitar? And if I see you do with this guitar, then I'm going to we'll promote you to a better guitar. And amen, look, he's leading worship. All over the nation he does this stuff. We have to anchor our faith in who he is rather than what we can do in our own strength. Now, let's talk about these giants real quick. How big were the giants in the land? Has anybody ever thought about that? Goliath was said to be nine feet tall. Now this would have been considered a small giant. Nine feet would have been considered a small giant. The book of Amos in 2 verse 9, it says it refers to Og as the Amorite. And it says, whose height was like the height of a cedar. And his strength was like an oak. Can you imagine? The average height of a cedar is 55 feet tall. That's what it said. I don't, I'm, just, I'm just telling what it says. 55 feet tall. And it was said that this was an average height of the giants in that time. 
And I'm not going to get all spooky and kooky and go into, we're going to go into a whole other thing about the giants. I'm reading what's in the Word. And if you have a problem with the Word, then you take it to the Word and you take it to God. But I'm telling you what the Word says. But let me tell you what. We've had encounters where we've seen angels. And me and my wife were just talking about this the other day. Like, well, no wonder the angels are so big and so massive and so to the sky. Man, they were trampling on these giants in those days. Come on. Holy Ghost. Kicking some giant butt. Og was a king. He was the king of Bashan. And he was likely the tallest man mentioned in the Bible. Og's destruction is told in Psalms 135 and 11. So that's for your notes. Psalms 135 and 11 and Psalms 136, 20. As one of the great victories of the nation of Israel. Deuteronomy 3.11 says this. King Og of Bashan was the last survivor of the giant Rephaites. His bed was made of iron and was more than 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. And still can be seen in the Ammonite city of Rabbah. Come on. You see, God chose Joshua. God chose Caleb. God chose Moses in that time. And when God commissions something, He always sees it to the victory. He doesn't commission you and say, oh, you're on your own. He doesn't do that. He says, Jeff, I've called you to be an overcomer. He says, Joanne, I've called you to be an overcomer. You're a conqueror. Tad, you will see the dead raised. You will walk in the power and the glory. This is what the Word says about who, who we are. And when God commissions you, when God sent you out, nothing can stop you. Nothing. You see, God commissioned Joshua. And Joshua 10.8, it reads this. This is what God's telling Joshua right here. Joshua 10.8. He says, do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua. For I have given you the victory over them, and not one single one of them will ever be able to stand up to you. <clears throat> Understand what he's talking about. Because he's about to go into battle. Joshua's about to go into battle. Now we're just mere men and mere soldiers. He's about to go and fight the giants. 15 feet tall, 20 feet tall, 9 feet tall, whatever you want to call them, giants. Anybody over 7 foot tall is wow. God promises Joshua the land, the promised land. And guess what? You and I are all recipients of the inheritance of the kingdom of God. There's a promise that God has given you that you have an inheritance of the kingdom. We are all recipients of the promise. In Joshua 1, verse 3 through 4, it says that the Lord made a covenant with Joshua and told him, Everywhere you put your sole of your foot, I will give to you. Be strong and of good courage. And do not be afraid, for I am with you for all the days of your life. And I am going to give you the possession of the land. Come on. Joshua knew who God was. He knew the promises that God had spoken over his life. <clears throat> but see, Joshua didn't have a relationship with God the way that we do. He didn't see through the finished work. He didn't see through the lenses of, of Jesus. He saw through the types and shadows and pictures. He didn't see how we see. Where we can walk in the intimacy in the garden. 
That's a whole other way of looking at the relationship with God. How much more do you and I possess as sons and daughters? Because we are grafted. We are, listen, we are grafted in the righteousness. <clears throat> we are grafted in the righteousness. We are grafted in the intimacy with the Father. <clears throat> he saw the faithfulness of God in every circumstance, in every battle, defeating the armies and the giants and the kings. Listen, the Joshua that I'm reading about, he was no joke, man. If you continue to read on, it talks about him going and defeating over 32 kings in the Bible. Not just the kings, but he destroyed their whole kingdom. These were armies and they were men and, and they all rose up against Israel. And he says, I will deliver, God told him, I will deliver you from your enemies. And he did. But God before you, who can be against you? Come on. Even back then, nothing could come against Israel. Even today, every, every, all this stuff that's going, I'm not going to get all political, but I'm going to tell you what, every nation that's coming against Israel, look, it is written what happens when you come against Israel. That's biblical. That's the Word. 32 nations destroyed. Hmm, that's a whole other message. So let's go to Joshua 10. Come on, Holy Ghost. We're going to start at uh, Joshua 10, and it says, Adonai Zedek, Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured and completely destroyed Ai and killed its king. Just as he destroyed the town of Jericho and killed its king. He also learned that the Gibeonites had been made peace with Israel, and now they were their allies. He and his people became very afraid, and they heard all of the, when they heard all of this, because Gibeon was a large town, as large as the royal cities, that, and larger that than Ai. And the Gibeonite men were strong warriors. So King Adonai Zedek of Jerusalem sent messengers to several other kings, Hoham of Hebron, Piram of Jamuth, Japhia of Lachish and Debir of Elgon. Come and help me destroy Gibeon, he urged them. For they have made peace with Joshua and the people of Israel. So five Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack. Now I want you to hear this. The Amorite kings, those were the giants. The giants were the Amorites. So, says, so five of the Amorite kings combined their armies for a united attack, and they moved all their troops into place and attacked Gibeon. The men of Gibeon quickly sent the message, messengers to Joshua and his camp at Gilgal. Don't abandon your servants now, they pleaded. Come at once, save us, help us. For all the Amorite kings who live in the hill country, have joined forces to attack us. So Joshua and his entire army, including his best warriors, left Gigal and set forth for Gibeon. And then the Lord says this, Do not be afraid of them. Listen. 
These were the giants. These were the armies of the enemy's camp. And Joshua is about to go and help somebody. And the Lord says, don't be afraid of them. Come on, that's what the Lord tells us. He's out, Bill, don't be afraid, Bill. I got you. Don't be afraid, Jody. Don't be afraid. This season's going to be awesome. <laughs> because when the Lord commissions you and sends you out, He always sets you up for victory. And the Lord says, do not be afraid of them, the Lord said to Joshua. He says, for I have given you victory over them. Not a single one of them will be able to stand up to you. Joshua then traveled all through the night from Gigal and took the armies of the Amorites by surprise. Then the Lord threw them into a panic, and the Israelites came and slaughtered a great number of them at Gibeon. And then the Israelites chased the army along the road to Bethron, killing all of them along the way to Ezka and Mekedah. As the armies of the Amorites retreated down the hall from Beth Haran, the Lord destroyed them with a terrible hailstorm from heaven that continued until they reached Ezka. The hail killed more of the enemy than the Israelites killed with their sword. On the day of the Lord, on that day, the Lord gave Israelites victory over the Amorites, and Joshua prayed to the Lord in front of all of the people of Israel and said, Let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. Come on. They killed. Can you imagine? I don't know how many people are in an army. But these were armies combining to make one army. And then you got five different kings of the Amorites, which meant you had five different tribes, five different kings of giants. And Joshua goes in there because he knew who he was. He knew the calling in his life. He knew the promises of God. He knew that God would not leave him. That God was faithful. And he went into that and he slayed the giants. What giants are in your land? What giants are in your land this morning? Joshua 11.21 reads this. During the period, Joshua destroyed all of the descendants of Enoch who lived in the hill country of Hebron, Debir, and Anab, an entire hill country of Judah and Israel. He killed all and completely destroyed their towns. None of the descendants of Enoch were left in all of the land of Israel. Some still remained in Gaza, Gath and Ashdod. So Joshua took control of the entire land just as the Lord had instructed Moses. He gave it to the people of Israel and to their special possession, dividing the land among the tribes so that the, line, the land finally had rest from war. You see, It's time that we begin to take back the land that the enemy has stolen from you. So I have a word that the Lord gave me last week sometime, and I'm going to share this word because I feel it kind of comes along with the season that we're in. So this is the word that I have for 2018, and I feel it's a word for the nation, it's a word for the body, it's a word for every single person. And this is what the Lord told me. He says, 
I am raising up right now those in the secret place. 2018, I heard the Lord say, it is the changing of the guard. I began to see where the Lord was passing a baton. A baton and He's releasing the new mantles. These batons, they were scrolls. But they were scrolls and swords together. It was like the scroll was in the hand, but it was a sword. There were scrolls and the sword, and they were being they were being used to bring an increase of the prophetic. There would be an increase in the prophetic word, and the sword would bring the correction to the bride. The scrolls carried the wisdom and the blueprints from heaven for the season at hand. The guard is changing as are the watchmen on the wall. The new breed is being positioned right now. They will be the carriers of God's presence and they will be full of stamina, passion, and reverence for God. God is raising up the remnant people now, the remnant bride. It's the breed, the new breed rising, the giant slayers. These are the ones that nobody knows. They're not the ones looking to be in the limelight. They're not the ones seeking the attention. They are the giant slayers. And I've always said this, if you want to be a giant killer, you got to hang out with giant killers. Bam. You can't kill giants hunting for rabbit. You just can't do it. You know, so I tell you this story and you hear about Joshua, and you hear about Moses, and you hear about Caleb, and you're like, well, man, these were mighty men of God, and they were in this time, and, you know, what? I mean, how do I even fit into this picture? Well, I'm going to tell you about a man who nobody knew. His name was Elhanan. Did you know that Elhanan, I hope I said his name right, he was a giant killer, just like Moses, Joshua, David. What can we learn from him? Because he's only mentioned once in the Bible. Only once or twice in the Bible. <clears throat> Sometimes our victories and our accomplishments may be similar in magnitude, but they're not, because they're, we're not well known, People don't acknowledge the victories in your accolades. Give me an example. You can see somebody like a Reinhard Bonnke, they can give a word. And that word comes with a... And everybody all over the world will gravitate to that word. But then somebody who doesn't have a following like a Bonnke or somebody will have such a powerful word from the Lord. But people won't receive it. Because they're not known like the Luingles or the Bonkies or the Maheshes. And... But it doesn't devalue the word because what they're speaking is truth. You see, Elhan wasn't a David, he wasn't a he wasn't a Joshua, he wasn't a Caleb, but he was a giant killer. <clears throat> he killed the giants. The important thing is this. We must be diligent in our duties and what our assignment is and what God has called us to do in this season. On December the 28th, I believe that's when we had our worship in the Word here. And uh, it was beautiful. We were worshiping and it was, I mean, and I had an encounter with the Lord. I want to share this with you. Because during this, the worship of the Lord, I was on a large boat. 
I was like on this large, beautiful boat. And on this boat, I was sitting on a chair and at a long table. I believe it was a father's table. I was sitting on this table and I was on this boat. And then I saw the, I could see like the Lord was preparing this feast for us. You know? And I saw with the Lord's hand where He, he put His hand. And I, I don't even want to say what it was because I don't know what it was, but it looked like a turkey. It looked like a chicken. It looked like something. But what it looked like was perfection. It was perfect. I mean, it was the color, the, the, the texture, everything. And then what I saw was I saw the Lord's hand come and, and, and rest on the, on, the, on the top of this thing. And I saw where he began to carve it. He began to carve slices. And they were like, I mean, and these slices that he was carving, they were perfect. They were perfect in size, the dynamics, everything about what I was seeing was perfection. And then I saw where the Lord, He went, and it's almost like, you know, Thanksgiving, when the person's cutting the turkey, and you come up with your plate, and they cut you that piece, and they, they lay that piece of, but it was just done so eloquently and so, like the Lord just kind of was serving me up this beautiful thing. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, what is it that I'm seeing? And he says this. He says, I am serving my portions this season. They are perfect, and every portion is healthy. God is releasing the portions to the bride, and it is time for you to eat off of your own plate. Not your neighbor's plate. Not the person down the street. He says, I have served you a portion this season. And it's perfection. It's healthy. What's your portion this season? Eli and Han is recorded as a giant slayer and will forever hold that accolade. Irrespective of the extent of how many people knew him, every time someone talks of Elhan, he will be known as a giant killer. Placed the same as David and Moses and Joshua and Caleb. First Chronicles 25 says this. And the war again with the Philistines, and Elhan, the son of Jer, slew Lami, the brother of Goliath. <laughs> Come on. Then in 2 Samuel 21 19, and there again was a battle of Gob. With the Philistines, where Elhan, the son of Jerigam, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gidi, with a staff and a spear that was like a weaving beam. You were called to be a giant slayer. You were called to kill the giants in the land. If not you, then who? Now you are a carrier of something even greater than what they carried. 
Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 says, once we receive the work of Christ, we are the righteous heirs of God. You are the righteous heir of God. You have been accepted into the family of God. And this truth defies your identity in Him. Now listen. As we prepare and we enter into 2018, let's prepare for victory. What giants are holding you back? Just like Joshua, God has promised you a great inheritance. Alice, come on up here. And it's time to take back. It's time to recover. It's time to restore. It's time to take back the land that the enemy has stolen from you. Before we move forward, I want Alice to share what she has. I was praying one night at Worship in the Word in our in the other room over here one night. And this was when we first got here. And the Lord had took me into this encounter. And the Lord was showing that to me again today. And I believe it's it's the timing of the Lord for me to share this for the region and for this area. And even for some of you that are that are watching for this new year, this is this is the Lord even speaking to you. I I began to see and I I began to see the ground shaking underneath my feet. And then as I began to see the ground shaking underneath my feet, I began to fear this, feel this fear come upon me. And I began to see the enemy walking and moving in its army. And I began to see the staffs and the tools and all their warrior things they were carrying. And every time they took a step forward, they would make this loud sound to the ground. And, and I began to see these gates. And as I began to see the gates in different areas, in different places... I began, I began to say, oh my God, we can't, let, we can't let the enemy get to the gates. We can't let them take over the gates. We can't let them be at the gates. Because the gates represent what goes in and what comes out. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, I'm standing there. And I began to see the angels come from heaven. And the enemy thought that it had won. The enemy thought that it, it had gained ground. The enemy thought that it was able to take captive every single gate. And all of a sudden, within seconds, I began to see the angelic show up from heaven and began to take over the gates. Before the enemy even took another step forward, the angels and the all of heaven began to come and put the gates together again where the destruction of the enemy came to the gates. I began to see the angels begin to take hold of the gates and take position at the gates again. And the shaking that was on the ground was no longer the enemy's. It was no longer the assignment of the enemy was broken. And it was broken and everything that was planned, the enemy had to destroy the land. The Lord showed up in the angelic and they retook and re-grabbed the land back and the gates of what was coming in and what was going out. So God, this morning, God, there will be a shaking in heaven, God, this morning, God. There will be such a shaking, God, and the changing of the guards, God, and the changing of our spirits, God, will begin to change this morning, God. And we take hold of the land in this place, God. That every assignment of the enemy, God, has no place and no ground anymore, God. Romahashata, 
team, just like you said this morning, God. The giant slayers have arrived. Let's just all stand this morning. Let me tell you something. This is not just about us. This is about every single person that is watching. This is about every single person that is standing in this place. I speak to every spirit inside of you right now. Let there be an awakening in your spirit this morning. That wherever you're watching from, wherever you're at, if you're standing in this place, that there will be such an awakening in your spirit that you would no longer be asleep any longer. We call forth the giant slayers right now. Oh God, we break off fear right now. We break off fear, 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 fear. You will be broken and you will be gone. Intimidation. You will be broken and you will be gone this morning. You will not exist in this place any longer. You will not exist in the homes of those watching and those here, God. So what I want us to do this morning, this is, this is uh, an opportunity for you. You know, and, and I've always said this, sometimes we have, to, we have to step out of our norm and we have to step out of our comfort zones. But we believe, and, I, and Alice just kind of confirmed that this morning, I believe it's today is a day that you slay your giants. You know what the giants are. We don't have to know the giants in your land. <clears throat> it's time that you take back your family. You take back your relationships. <clears throat> you take back your joy. You take back your peace. You take back the love for others. Who's willing to cry for restoration this morning? If that's you, if that's you this morning, I want you to come up front and we're going to do a prophetic act together. Thank you, Father. So, Father, we're just going to do a prophetic act. As I begin to, I'm just going to do this. We're just going to begin to wave the sword this morning. And we declare, God, right now. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, God, we declare with heaven, God, as we wave our sword, that we decapitate every giant in our land right now. In the name of Jesus, we render him powerless. Every fear, every intimidation. Now, in the name of Jesus, we cut the head of the giants. We cut the head of the giants, God. 
And the same way you were before Joshua, Caleb, Moses, that you would go before us, God. We declare our victory in 2018. We call forth restoration in this house, in our families, in our jobs, in our finances, in our marriages, in our relationships. We call forth now in the name of Jesus. More victory in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh!